Mr. Destiny. <laughs> Anyways, it's a privilege to be in front of you this morning. Um, Pastor Dustin, about four weeks ago, asked if I would like to kind of cover for him as he uh, allows his baby to come into this world. And, and uh, of course, I was hesitant. I said, boy, I've been preaching all the time. It's not a thing. Um, but, you know, in faith, I stepped up and I said, you know what, I got you now. So, um, it is a privilege to be up here with you, um, to speak to you this morning. And, um, you know, something's really, really special about this church. Um, Cheryl and I noticed it when she came, and Jen noticed it when we came. And um, there's a great deal of warmth in this church. Um, I can remember the first day we came here, people were running across the aisle to welcome. Everybody's one of the first ones. And um, we were just like, man, so friendly, so warm. And that warmness um, kind of cuts the nerves a little bit this morning for me. I don't feel like I'm talking to a congregation. I feel like I'm a family member talking to my family. And um, so praise God that we can all converse together this morning. We can we can deal with some tough issues in this church and we can all come out of it saying, Jesus is the victory. Amen? Amen. Something that does make me nervous is when I open up this book sometimes. And when I was writing this sermon uh, for the past week or so, uh, I got nervous because what am I going to preach? How am I going to preach it? It's going to be biblically sound. And, you know, you can work through those things. But one thing that happens when you open up this book is that God talks to you. And sometimes I get a little scared about that because when you write a sermon, you have to be honest with yourself, you have to be honest with the people that hear you, you have to be honest with God. And He calls you out sometimes. Sometimes, you know, you know what I'm saying? When you read a, a, a passage, it's like saying, I'm talking right to you. I'm not talking to the Israelites. I'm not talking to the early Christian church. I'm talking directly to you. You feel that sometimes? And so, preparing this uh, sermon, I felt like God was speaking directly to me. And so, when I share this, I hope that you're blessed as I was blessed. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the Son. Thank you so much for your Son. Thank you so much for this Sabbath day. We know that you are our Redeemer as well as our Creator, and that's why we worship you this day. Lord, as I speak, anoint my lips. May it be you that are speaking through me. May it not be my selfish ambition, my selfish motivation. May it be you speaking so that we may be transformed, we may be changed this morning. I pray all these things in your name. Have you ever been caught in the middle of a storm? I think we have this past couple weeks, haven't we? <laughs> Just this past week, the state of Washington has experienced record-breaking numbers. According to US Today, USA Today, the city of Seattle experienced its snowiest month so far in 70 years. Seventy years. Seventy years ago, the world, world War II ended just four years before that. It's been a long time. And I was able to pull up this... I was able to pull up this article here. It didn't just devastate Seattle, it devastated the whole entire state. In Yakima, more than 100 1,700 dairy cattle were killed in the middle of the storm, all in one day. I have the article here, the snowstorm carrying heavy winds ranging from 30 to 80 miles per hour and resulting in 18 to 24 inches of snow on Saturday, devastated dairy farmers in Yakima County. Since the region is typically arid, the dairy farms are built with lot, open lots or open-sided shelters to house the cows. In other words, since the region typically gets only six to eight inches of rain annually, cows 
are kept in shelters without walls, leaving them blindsided without time or resources to prepare for the anticipated brutal blizzard. Cows were huddled in, pressed up against each other in corners of pens, and refused to move. Farmers couldn't get them to move into milking barns. It's the herd's instinct. Most cows died of injuries from each other, and some from cold exposure. Each cow is worth $2,000. So we're looking at about $3.2 million plus dollars, plus production loss. But right now, it was a large, huge emotional loss of farmers. A couple days ago, that's what my car looked like. <laughs> talking to Bronson while we were clearing up the, the car and he said, boy, it looks like you put a purple mattress up there. <laughs> we're transferring a uh, mattress in the street. It was an epic, wasn't it? I went to Fred Meyer before the storm started and the bread aisle was empty, the water aisle was empty, funny, the candy aisle was empty too. <laughs> And on Facebook, people were dubbing it hashtag snowpocalypse. It was a storm of epic proportions. For the state of Washington, anyway. A couple weeks before that, I was at Walmart and I was FaceTiming my mom and dad because they're in Chicago. And they were expect, uh, experiencing the Arctic blast down there. Negative 50 degrees. Negative 50 degrees. And I was bragging about 48 at the time. I think God wanted me to bite my tongue the week after. But it was epic. But when you watch that storm, when you see all this, there's something crazy about it, but something beautiful, isn't it? It leaves something beautiful. And there's some of you, and I'd like to know how many of you enjoy storms. How many of you like to sit in your house and listen to the rain patter against the roof of your house, the thunder rolling and shaking the foundations of your wall. Oh yeah, you know what I'm talking about. And then the adrenaline rush when there's a flash of lightning maybe right outside your doorstep. Mm. Sometimes before I used to play on my phone uh, uh, the rain, uh, like a loop, so I could fall asleep. Sometimes I'd open up a window and listen to the howling wind and, and listen to the rain and it's put me right to bed. It's beautiful. In college, um, I would actually sneak out of my dorm and then sleep in my car because I love to listen to the rain and a storm flashing right around me. It was beautiful. So I'm one of those people. Some of you aren't with me all the time. But I'd like to kind of change the experience. Why, why do we like that experience so much? Why, why are we so relaxed when we hear that experience? I venture to say that's because you're still alive after that experience. <laughs> you get to experience the awesomeness of God's power. You get to experience nature at its finest. You can feel chaos but be at peace at the same time. But have you ever really been caught middle of the storm. Take away the shelter of your house. Stand in the middle of the field. Oh yeah, this is Chicago. People were throwing, sorry, people were throwing boiling hot water above their heads and it would instantly turn to snow. It was pretty cool. Yeah, it was awesome. But have you ever been caught in the middle of the storm? Almost, right? Wasn't there a, a, a tornado here? I would venture to say that that enjoyable experience that we talked about would be an enjoyable one. It would be chaos. I think I would be hiding and curling down in the ground asking, God, when will this end? Please protect me. Because now your life is in danger. Have we ever been caught in the middle of the storm? Turn with me to Mark chapter 4, verse 35. Straight through this. Say amen when you're there. 
Verse 35, starting verse 35. On the same day when evening had come, he said to them, Let us cross over to the other side. Now when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was, and other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that it was already filled. But he was in the stern, asleep on a pillow. And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Then he rose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. But he said to them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no fear? And they feared exceedingly, and said to one another, Who can this be, that even the wind and sea obey him? Before we can unpack this text, we have to see where the narrative fits in the book of Mark. Let's get a running start here. In the previous chapters, if you want to flip over chapter 1, you can. Jesus begins his ministry performing miracle after miracle. In fact, Mark is considered the most action-packed gospel out of the four gospels. It's all about action for Mark. If you look at Mark chapter 1, this writer skips the birth of Christ, runs quickly through the baptism of Jesus, spends two verses on Christ being tempted in the wilderness, and straight into his ministry. It seems like this was almost intentional. It's like, yes, you're going to know about his birth. Yes, you're going to know about the temptation. You're going to know about his baptism. But let's get to the juicy stuff. Let's talk about his ministry. And Jesus starts with one thing. His ministry with four fishermen. Four fishermen. Before any mirror. And then he pushes on, taking four fishermen, and he grows to 12, and then we have a multitude, and we come to chapter 3, verse 13. And let's read that. And, th and if you're wondering, if you're wondering, why am I following Jesus this morning? And what does he want me to do? We can find it here. And he went up to the mountain and called to him those he himself wanted, and they came to him. Then he appointed 12, that they might be with him, and that he might send them out to preach. Pretty black and white, right? Jesus starts his ministry, he calls on people, and then he gives them a purpose. Mark spends the first quarter of the gospel about Jesus just growing his following, and now he decides to call who? Fishermen unto himself. You see, throughout the Bible, God tends to operate this way. You have seen it with Abraham, how he was called out of his land. You've seen how the Jewish nation was called out of, out of Egypt and Babylon. And even in Revelation, God calls his children out of Babylon as well. And God is calling us now. In fact, when we look at the word church in Greek, it is actually called ecclesia. Ecclesia. Ek, out, paleo, call. And Jesus is looking for his ecclesia. It means the called out ones. And in order to be called an ecclesia, you have to be called out of something that you were previously in. Right? If we want to call ourselves the Fort Orchard Seventh-day Adventist Church, we're actually calling ourselves ones of Fort Orchard who have been called out. Different from the city of Fort Orchard, we are called out of Fort Orchard. That's really, really, really important. Because there's got to be a different, differentiation between the other and us. And God calls us out. I remember when I had my ecclesia moment. Unfortunately, it wasn't when I was super young and I was in, in the church. Unfortunately, I didn't think church was very cool at the time. It wasn't very entertaining, that was for sure. And I didn't feel safe. Quite honestly. Sad but true. Everybody was preaching, talking about being honest and vulnerable, and then in the back rooms, people are just gossiping and trying to posture for, for position in the church, and people will get hurt. 
the church wasn't for me. But my actual Ecclesia moment was when I attended Las Vegas University College. Up until that point, I had never studied on an Adventist campus. I grew up in public school, learning about the world, focused on how to be successful in the world, and the negative and positive influences that came along with it. But when I stepped foot on that campus at Las Vegas, it was weird. It was really, really weird for me. I had never witnessed people my age praying in public to God. People ate weird. They dressed weird. They even spoke a little bit different. It's like, hey, brother, hey, brother. Now, my brother, wait, what? I didn't understand the concept of it. And I really, honestly, I'm really honest, I didn't think those people existed. I only had an experience in a church, maybe like a conference uh, meeting. But my experience with them was attracted me to them even more. They were a peculiar people. My experience with them was authenticity, empathy, love, self-control, and kindness. I even experienced forgiveness. That's where I met Jed and Cheryl and other close friends that are now my lifelong friends. And although they were different, I didn't really want to accept that at first. I grew up in a public school. I had to watch my back. I was worried about my reputation. I had to be cool. I had to be popular. But my new friends didn't care about that. And it was super weird. They actually cared about me as an individual. They wanted to hang out just to hang out. And Jen, I don't know if you remember uh, uh, my first birthday at, at New College. Jen gave me a card saying, don't worry, God is in charge. And over it be 12 years now, I kept it in my wallet. And it's got two penguins and one fish eating one penguin and the other penguin saying, relax, God is in charge. <laughs> <laughs> and and you know, I had never received any spiritual gift or anything. This is probably my first real spiritual gift. And I didn't understand it at the time. And uh, in the back it says, and Jed wrote this, I, I hope this card brings you a smile and reminds you that God's in charge and that you always have my support. <laughs> Dang, I'm crying again. <laughs> I don't, I, uh, when I read that, I broke down like this. For the first time. <clears throat> I didn't experience authenticity. I didn't have a real friend. <laughs> it was too good to be true. It was too good to be real. But I had to know where this authenticity came from. <clears throat> but through my friendships, I realized that I didn't need things of this world that are required to have, or buy, or eat, or drink, objectify, take advantage of, and it, that those things were not necessary to have authentic, happy moments in your life. And what I experienced through those friends, through that card, was God's way of calling me out from a, a current life to a new life. Yeah. So the ministry of Jesus, where Jesus calls his disciples out, is in the same way he calls us out. An ecclesia moment. You know, there were many times in my life where I was doing something that I wasn't supposed to be doing. I was listening to something that I wasn't supposed to be listening to. I was watching something I wasn't supposed to be watching to. And don't you hate it when God just calls you out in the middle of it? Mm. You're doing what you want to do. You're enjoying. And then all of a sudden, God says, hey, Sandra, what you doing? 
I always hated that. I would just yell outside sometimes, God, why are you doing that? Let me be. Why are you trying to be with me, Jesus? And, and the reason is right there in chapter 3. He called them so he could be with them. God cannot exist. God cannot dwell in a place of sin. God cannot dwell in a place where, where he is rejected. But he wants to come out of it. So he can be with you. Isn't that amazing? He just wants to be with us. Despite what we keep trying to do to ourselves. So at the point of the, of the story, Jesus has taken his disciples on a journey. Healing, preaching, teaching, performing miracles. And he spends chapters 3 and 4 teaching and sharing day after day. And when we read back at Mark 4 verse 35 where our story really begins. I really like how Ellen White puts it in Desire of Ages. She says, All day he had been teaching and healing, and as evening came on the crowd, still pressed upon him day after day, he had ministered to them, scarcely pausing for food and rest. The malicious criticism and misrepresentation with which the Pharisee, Pharisees constantly pursued him made his labors much more severe and harassing. And now the close of the day found him so utterly weary that he determined to seek retirement in some solitary place across the lake. And when we read verse 36, now when they left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was. As he was. That is something very powerful. Because it's saying that Jesus needed a retreat. He needed time away. The question, does Jesus get tired? Yeah, he gets tired. He needs time away. Several times he went up the mountain to rest, to recuperate, to pray. He was exhausted from sharing with them practical applications from the physical world they knew to the spiritual world that they still couldn't comprehend. Jesus shared about fasting, the Sabbath, and under what authority he operates, and they continue to push back to try to contradict, to try to refute him and wrestle with him. Constant doubt and questioning. And so Jesus needed a retreat. The disciples took him as he was, meaning that they probably assisted him into the boat, fatigued and tired. Why is this so important? Because this verse shows the humanity of Jesus Christ. Although he was 100% God, he chose to withhold his divinity and become human for us. He wanted to experience what we were experiencing. The reason why this is relevant is because this makes Christ a better high priest for you. In Hebrews 4.15, we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. I love this verse. Because when you're going through a storm, we now have a God who can say, I know what you're going through. We don't have a God who cannot relate to us. We have a God who experienced everything you are experiencing and today, and you cannot tell me, him, or anybody in this world that God does not understand. That's why he's so approachable. That's why we can come to him, and that is why he died for us, and was able to intercede for us. Because when the wrath of God is poured out onto the earth, we have Jesus as our advocate. He understands what we are going through. And he will say, Father, not him. Father, not her. I understand that. So let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. We move on to verse 37. It says, And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that it was already Building. You know what I noticed when I read the Bible? That God doesn't save people from the storm. Rather, he saves people through the storm. 
Something often happens when, we're, when we feel like we're on cruise control, when we can rest, when we're in a good, on a good Christian high, sometimes people call it. A storm comes. All of a sudden, tragedy strikes. Right when life is going the way you thought it would. Right when you get to live and enjoy it, a storm comes. We have to understand that this world is an evil world. That life is never smooth sailing. In Matthew 7, 24, God is talking about building a house on a rock and building a house on the sand. Do you notice that some houses fall, some houses stand? But 100% of the houses receive the storm. Whether you're Christian, heathen, atheist, Buddhist, whatever, you are going to experience a storm. Really now, the only difference is if you want to build your house on the rock or if you want to build your house on the sand. The storm's coming, whether you like it or not. So do you want to be on a Christian walk when the storm comes, or do you want to be on a walk on your own when the storm comes? We all have different storms. They can be financial. They can be relational. They can be intellectual. They can be cosmical. But no matter how, how you slice it or dice it, we are all susceptible to that storm. And that's life. But in this particular storm, the ship was filled. And I may not know about engineering on a boat, but I have watched the movie Titanic. <laughs> and when there's enough water on that boat, it's going down. I like how Ellen White puts it again in Desire of Ages. It says, The waves lashed into fury by the howling winds, dashed fiercely over the disciples' boats, the boat, and threatened to engulf it. Those hardy fishermen had spent their lives upon the lake and had guided their craft safely through many a storm. But now their strength and skill availed nothing. They were helpless in the grasp of the tempest and hope failed them as they saw their hope was filling. This was a storm that is beyond human intervention. No matter how much Peter was trying to get a bucket, grab a bucket, pull the sails, turn it this way, turn it that way, the boat was still filling. These were fishermen with experience. And perhaps you are a person with experience. But this is a storm that we are all not prepared for. Ellen White says that their skill and strength are built to nothing. And there's a very glaring problem here. Jesus is in the boat, isn't he? Why didn't they wake up Jesus when the boat was filling up? Why, would, why when the storm begins to blow and the water begins to trickle in, why don't they say, uh, Jesus, something's happening here. Wake up. You know, sometimes we work so hard to get the water out of our own ships and our love, in our lives. We're so focused in trying to clean up our own mess that we forget that Jesus is there to clean up for us. Did you notice that Jesus was in the back of the boat when he should be at the front of the boat? Many times we put Jesus in the back of our boats when he should be in the front. And he should also be in the front of our minds, in front of our hearts, but we put him in the back. But like the disciples, we have a natural tendency to try to save ourselves. Sometimes we keep Jesus as a convenience on the back of our boats. Sometimes we run to him when we have a problem and we wake him up or pull him out of our little pockets or run to our dusty Bibles and dust it off and try to find an answer. Church, I challenge us to bring Jesus to the front of the boat. Have Jesus take the wheel before your lungs. And when the storms come, in, come, make Jesus the first thing you run to. Before the water even fills up our boats, Jesus is already awakened in our hearts and in our minds. Can we make Jesus the captain of our ship? You know, technology is amazing nowadays. 
when you want to know something, when you're having a conversation with someone and they're like, what is that? I don't know the definition of it. What do you say? What do you say? Google, right? Google it. You go right to Google. You know, Google is a company. It's a noun. It's a person, place, or thing. But now we get into a verb. Google it. To Google, right? And when we don't know something, we go consult Google. We look to the world when we don't, we don't, don't know something. Well, what if we consult Jesus first in everything we do? What if the first question and the first point of consultation is to run our Bibles to find the answer? Now, I'm not putting Google down. It's useful. I use it sometimes. But what if the worldly questions or the worldly problems we have in our lives receive spiritual consideration first? Instead of Googling it, we can Bible it or Jesus it. We don't need to look for an expert. We can go to Jesus. Put them in the front of your book instead of the back. And perhaps we'll be more prepared for this moment. In verse 38, Jesus was in the stern of the boat, on a pillow. And the boat is filling. There's a problem here, isn't it? First, if Jesus is in the back of the boat, and the ship was filling with water, wouldn't be Jesus wet? Wouldn't it be wet for Jesus? You know, you have true peace when you know you can sleep wet. When I was in elementary school, I was one of those quiet kids. I didn't smile at anyone, I kind of to myself. Um, I had anger issues and things like that, so I just like, you know, back up, you know, back up, because you don't want to give me mad. But I still kind of, by, by that, I think I still attract people that, that want to play friends with me. And uh, gently friends with me all the time. <laughs> And uh, one night at a, at a camp meeting in elementary school, somebody put, put a, a warm water, while I was sleeping, put warm water next to my bed, and then my hand put it. <laughs> <laughs> you know what happens when that happens? <laughs> you can't sleep wet. You can't have peace when you're sleeping wet, can you? Yet Jesus was able to do that. After he was... After he was exhausted and tired, he was still asleep in the boat. And the disciples come and shake him, and they, and they say, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? <laughs> Isn't it interesting that we always question God's compassion when we are going through a trial? When we are in the midst of a storm, we always say, Well, obviously God doesn't care. So does God care? That is the question. And yes, of course He does. He does care. And, and what He does next is vital. Vital to our faith. Faith of His disciples and the faith of His disciples because when all hope is lost and after we spend all our efforts to save ourselves, Jesus gives us this answer. And it says there, Jesus arose. He rose to the occasion when they could. That is the answer. Do you not care? Well, I will rise. He stood up to the storm when they were holding onto the sides of the boat, hunched over, and could barely stand. He, he rose. The disciples' hope was all gone. He rose because he wanted us to know, he wanted you to know, that he has power over that storm. He rose because he wanted to show you that he cares and that he that we shouldn't look for hope in ourselves, rather hope in him. And the Bible says he rose to his feet and he rebuked the wind and said to the sea and only said three simple words. Peace. Be still. And there was a great calm. The Redeemer now spoke as the Creator, like He did thousands of years ago when He created this earth. He said, Peace, be still. The authority of His voice caused the wind and sea to obey Him. You see, the physical world has to obey Jesus. The laws of physics 
have to obey Jesus because he wrote the laws. He wrote water into existence. He can make water go up. He can make water go down. He can make it go side to side because he wrote water into existence. The waters obey Jesus because he spoke it and he can split it right down the middle if he wants to. But I believe, I believe Jesus exercised the supernatural not only to rebuke the storm, but to release the storm from within. Peace be still. Jesus' act was not an act of self-glorification. Rather, it, it was him ministering to his disciples. He wanted them to understand that they too can have the power in the midst of the storm. And how is that possible? This is what is really crucial about this story. When Jesus was awakened to meet the storm, he was in perfect peace. There was no tra trace of fear in word or look, for no fear was in his heart, but he rested not in possession of almighty power. It was not as the master of earth and sea and sky that he reposed in quiet. That power he had laid down. Jesus laid down that power. In John 5, 30, it says, I can of my own self do nothing. And Ellen White says there, he trusted in the Lord's might. It was in faith, faith in God's love and care that Jesus rested and the power of that word which still the storm was the power of God. <clears throat> Jesus himself did not rebuke the wind and the waves to show omnipotence over his creation. Rather, he rested on his connection with his Father, and his Father gave him the power. Why did he do this? He's God anyway. The reason why, because he wants to show you and me that we can channel heavenly power through our faith. Because if Jesus acted as creator, his ministry would be flawed. We no longer have a high priest who can relate to us. We no longer have an earth, earthly example to live by. We also don't have an earthly example to take our place at the cross because he doesn't experience what we experience. Jesus used the connection with his Father so we don't have to be fearful. Rather, we have hope because we have Jesus who is in our boat. And that kind of faith can move mountains. And if you can move a mountain, I'm sure you can calm the storms in your life. Psalm 77 says, The water saw you, O God. The water saw you. They were afraid. The depths also trembled. Do you understand that water is afraid of God? When God comes into, into in front of an ocean, the waters and the depths tremble. They say, we better do what he wants us to do, because he can do whatever he wants with us. That's the power of the Creator. That's the power that we are trying to channel every time we pray. The ministry of Jesus was to call out his people to himself, heal them and fill them with knowledge of who he is, and then become the author and finisher of our faith. Ellen White says, when the tempest of temptations gather, and the fierce lightning splash, and the waves sweep over us, we battle with the storm alone, forgetting that there is one who can help us. We trust to our own strength till our hope is lost, and we are ready to perish. Then, we remember Jesus, and if we call upon him to save us, we shall not cry in vain. Though he sorrowfully reproves our unbelief and self-confidence, he never fails to give us the help we need. Whether on the land or on the sea, if we have a Savior in our hearts, there is no need of fear. When we ask ourselves, how can I get through this storm? When we wonder, when, or when we wonder, will this storm ever end? The answer is and always will be Jesus Jesus, Jesus. 
everyone is going to go through their own storms. But there is somebody in that storm with you. Why don't we just let go and let God? Why do we continue to trust in our own power to calm the storm? Think of the storm that you have been in, or maybe the storm that you are in right now, and know that Jesus can lift you up in the midst of that storm. And by faith, you can have peace in the storm. When Jesus stands, he doesn't stand for himself. Rather, he stands to bring peace into your life. I have a storm that I'd like to share with you uh, that I experienced in my life. After my Ecclesia moment, after I was riding high on Christianity and learning about it, I probably, I experienced probably the biggest storm in my life. In my ever-growing knowledge in Christianity and Christian friends, I thought everything was leading up to this one moment. God presented me with a relationship. I remember when I was in my final year at last year, I, my eyes were ready to go to Loma Linda for my doctorate. I was ready to move on. And that this last year, I believe God blessed me with a relationship. With this woman, a pastor, a Christian woman, a straight A student, a God fearing woman. I said, This is perfect. This is exactly where I'm supposed to go. And I remember when I first met her, because, because when, my, when I first met her, my sister had to introduce me to her. The reason why is because there was this huge line of guys that were always trying to to meet, meet her and talk to her and hang out with her and date her. And I, I said hello and hello and that was it. She was busy talking to other guys. And and how, question is guys, how, how do you pull a girl away from the crowd when she has her kick of the litter? How? Well, I found a secret, at least for this particular person, but, but I'm not condoning it, okay? I'm sharing it with you, I'm being vulnerable, but I'm not condoning it. But here's the secret. Ignore her. <laughs> it might work for some of you today, it's not <laughs> How do you grab their attention? Ignore her. Ignore her. Imagine a, a, a sea of, of guys, different guys that wanted to date her. I mean, short, tall, skinny, fat, There's musical, singers, saxophone players, bodybuilders, <laughs> basketball players, everything. There, there was a guy that she, she had met, his name was Colt. Colt. That is a really cool name. <laughs> I wish my name was Colt. And, and Colt means a horse, right? He was built like a horse. I mean, his neck was like the size of my waist. His arms were the size of my thighs. I mean, washboard hats, everything. Mack truck, chest, everything. How can I compete? Oh yeah, and he had like a full-on beard. And I'm Asian and I can't grow a beard. <laughs> I mean, I can't compete. I, I just can't compete. But you know, she noticed me when I ignored her. Because I was the only one that ignored her. And so when, when we crossed by, I purposely said, don't look at her. Don't look at her. She's going to like this. Don't look at her. And, and sure enough, she's like, when she, when she kind of gave me a nod, I was like, Look away. When she'd smile at me, I'd be like, give a confused look. Whatever. I don't condone this, but it worked in this case. And so I got pulled away from that crowd. We met, we started dating. And a few years later, I actually popped the question. And as I started, as we started to try to start our family together, I felt, I felt even more deeper in the work. She was a pastor's kid. Her dad gave me Bible studies every single evening. I learned a lot more than I ever had in my entire life. We had a five-year plan. She was going to graduate. We were going to have kids and, and move up north, everything. It was perfect. And then the storm came. What I thought was a happy marriage turned out to be something completely unexpected. What I thought was a healthy marriage became, some, became an unhealthy one. And what I thought was a faithful marriage turned out to be an unfaithful one. 
A storm had come into my life. The turbulent waves of an affair filled my boat and I was sinking. The discovery of my wife, who I grew closer to Jesus with, was having another relationship with someone else. And to add insult to injury, I knew that man. I knew that man. We went on double dates together. So eventually, my wife and I separated, and we filed for divorce. The pain and heartbreak overtook my life. Not only that, but I was worried about my reputation. A Christian man, a man who is a young adult leader uh, in the Spanish church in Old Women. Men that was starting to preach sermons at the pulpit. I was that guy that got the girl, remember? I was riding high. What would my friends think of me now? What would my parents think of me now? What would my church think of me now? You know, when something hurts so bad, you try to do something else, you try to pick up a hobby. Well, to fill that void, I was I leaned against acting. I got into acting. And it took off pretty well. <coughs> I was lead in a couple shows, and, and I did a movie, and all this stuff, it was great. But then, it, in, in, the show, in the world of showbiz, it's not who you are, but who you know, and what you're willing to give up to get that part. And so, there was that boy again. And <coughs> then I decided to be on the world of photography. Judd was kind enough to show me the world of photography, and, and I loved it. I said, great, this is great. We're going to go hiking every weekend. We're going we're gonna to take pictures. It's going to be beautiful. I'm going to experience God's nature. I'm going to reconnect with God again. And I just didn't have the time. It became a hobby. When I realized that my photos weren't going to get out there, there was that void once again. So after that, I began to feel insecure about myself. Insecure about my faith. I started seeing pictures on social media and videos of my wife getting engaged and getting married again. She had moved on and I was still hurting. I thought my Ecclesia moment with my new Christian friends, attending an Adventist college, my Bible studies would lead me to a happy Christian marriage and it did not. I thought I put myself in the right position with God so why, so why am I going through the worst pain in my entire life? I started to think, maybe my old life is better. But when I did, I found myself hurting more than just myself, but I began to hurt others too. I tried and tried to get my life back, but as Ellen White said, now my strength and my skill avail to nothing. It was a storm beyond my understanding, beyond something I could ever go through, that I could fix on my own. And I was saying, God, I am sinking. Don't you care? Don't you care? And when I stopped trying to pull myself up, and when I stopped trying to earn my reputation back, when I stopped putting forth my self-worth, putting my self-worth in somebody else or into a hobby, when I stopped trying to keep my boat from sinking, Jesus rose and said to me, Peace, be still. Why are you so fearful, Sam? How is it that you do not have to fail? And Jesus was right. I did not have to fail. I didn't even run to him to calm the storm. I had stored Jesus in the back of my boat rather than put him at the bow. But Jesus rose. And little did I expect, there was a great calm. A great calm. And out of that calm came a friend.
since you might fear and failures. And even offered healing when I hurt. She became my best friend. And someone that didn't just want me to heal, but wanted to walk through the storm with me. And in that time, and this is why I know Jesus worked. In that time, she was praying for problems in her school. She spent twice the amount of years in a relationship <coughs> trying to have a God-centered relationship. She was praying for a conversion, and it didn't happen. She was looking for healing and direction for an uncertain <coughs> future like mine. And so we both started talking, and talking led to studying, and studying led to a walk in faith. And we ended up being each other's answer to prayer. <laughs> Some of you saw my uh, Facebook post on, uh, when, I, when I proposed, and I said these words. I was praying for three years I had prayed for clarity in my confusion, freedom from my anger, and guidance from being lost. I learned about the power of prayer and how eager God is willing to bless us when we defer to His will. And it all came in full circle when she told me I was also her answer. The Bible says there was a great calm in the storm. A great calm means that there was a greater calm than the calm before it. That means that when Jesus intercedes in the storm in your life, you are going to come out better than you did before the storm. <clears throat> you are better off when you start, than you started. You know, God really works in mysterious ways. We often doubt His power. But we have to remember that He is not just a Redeemer, but He is our original Creator, who can work through supernatural mediums. We cannot forget this is a God who spoke time into existence. Therefore, He has perfect timing. And even though I didn't know what I was going through, Jesus knew. Even though Cheryl didn't know what she was going through, Jesus knew. The Bible says in 107, 29, He calms the storm so that its waves are still. Then they are glad because they are quiet. So He guides them to their desired haven. This year, Cheryl and I are going to go before the Lord in the area. And we want you to know, everyone to know, that Jesus has come our stories. And that He can calm the storms in your life. We want our marriage to be an example of what Jesus can do if you give him control of your thoughts. Church, whether you are going through an ecclesia moment, being called out, or if you're a non-believer or if you're on the fence, we are all going to go through a storm. The question is, if you want Jesus in your boat during that storm, how many of you want Jesus in your boat? If you want Jesus in your boat and want him to make him the father and finisher of your faith, say amen. amen. And as Jen and Cheryl sings this song, I pray that Jesus tells us again, peace, be still, and know that I am God.